The hearing will come to order. Thank you, everyone, for being here this morning. I'll start with my opening, and then we'll, I'll turn to Ranking Member Scott. This week marks the 32nd anniversary of the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act. As we commemorate that anniversary, our committee will examine an important disability issue, how to improve the accessibility of federal information technology for people with disabilities. The COVID-19 pandemic accelerated a long-term shift in delivering government services using uh, virtual front doors instead of physical front doors. Mm. Unfortunately, over the years, the U.S. government has not prioritized making these virtual front doors accessible to people with disabilities, especially um, most recently. Digital access significantly affects older Americans and veterans who experience disabilities at higher rates than the general population and more frequently use these government services. Federal law requires, requires that the executive branch um, agencies make their technology accessible to people with disabilities. However, bipartisan oversight that I've led shows that the U.S. government is falling short on digital accessibility. I want to thank R Ranking Member Scott and our aging committee colleague, Senator Burr, for joining me in these oversight uh, efforts. In 2018, my office heard from uh, veterans who have uh, a disability or, or more than one disability who reported problems accessing the Department of Veterans Affairs websites and kiosks. In response, I worked alongside Senator Jerry Moran to pass the Bipartisan VA Website Accountability Act in 2020. That law requires the VA to report on the accessibility of its websites and intake kiosks. The resulting report had stark findings. Fewer than 10%, let me say that again, fewer than 10% of its websites were fully accessible as of last fall, and the department plans to fix them, and the department's plans to fix them were, in a word, inadequate. My understanding is that the VA will soon be responding to the letter that I sent with Senator Scott and other colleagues regarding these longstanding accessibility shortfalls. I'll be reviewing these plans and look forward to working with the department to address these longstanding issues. While serious, the VA's accessibility shortfalls are not unique, unfortunately. A long list of federal agencies and even the White House have settled lawsuits in recent years alleging their websites and technology are not accessible. That's why I'm concerned that the Department of Justice has not evaluated uh, federal technology access for a decade. Federal law requires, as I said, uh, these evaluations every two years. The Biden administration has rightfully prioritized improving digital access, but years of inattention to accessibility means there's still a lot of work uh, to do. Someone who just happens to live in the same county I live in. Ron, his name is Ron Biglin, and I'm holding up a, a letter, some of which I've highlighted. Uh, Ron Biglin, he lives in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania, just um, not too far from Scranton. Um, he is one of the people who suffered from this inattention, and he submitted a statement for the record, and um, I'll make that statement part of the record. Ron Biglin is an Air Force veteran who's blind. He can fish kayak, and even do online banking. But the VA's My Healthy Vet site does not, does not work with his screen reader, making him uh, unable to use it. Ron wrote in, in a pertinent part in his statement, quote, when you are visually impaired, you want to be as independent as possible. And having problems getting on VA websites takes away this independency. If the VA could lead the way to make access easier, this would be a great plus. And then also other government agencies could do the same, unquote. Couldn't have said it any better than Ron Biglin said it. We wouldn't ask someone using a wheelchair to walk up courthouse steps. But in a real sense, we're doing something similar when we ask people with disabilities to use federal websites. We're saying that all the time. 
um, in, in government services. And thankfully, it's worked for a lot of Americans. But when we're telling people to use these federal websites or mobile apps or other technology uh, that are inaccessible, that makes no sense. We've got to do better than that uh, as, a, as a federal government and as a society. So I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. And I look forward to hearing how to address these issues for people with disabilities, for seniors, and for veterans across the country like Ron Biglin and so many others. So I'll turn to Ranking Member Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Without any question, we look forward to hearing your testimony. For many of our nation's seniors and people with disabilities, accessing federal resources and services has been too big of a problem that must be solved. This is especially true for our veterans, and that's why Senator Casey and I are working to solve problems with a variety of solutions. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your participation in, in so many of the efforts to include working with the VA and to improve the website accessibility for disabled veterans and disabled VA employees. We also requested the DOJ comply with reporting requirements regarding improved website accessibility for Americans with disabilities. In May, I hosted an event to honor our active duty, reserve, and National Guard military personnel, defense contractors, and those who fought in Afghanistan and Iraq. We had nearly 700 att attendees at home in Charleston, South Carolina. It was a wonderful event. It's a wonderful way for us to acknowledge the incredible sacrifice uh, and those who serve our country should be honored on a consistent basis. I would like to acknowledge our South Carolina service members, veterans, and those currently stationed at military bases throughout this nation. One out of four of our veterans have a disability that is consistent with their military service. And the median age of our veterans is around the age of 65. Tony Green is a veteran from Charleston, South Carolina, who served in the Navy for eight years. Following his military career, he had trouble assimilating into civilian life and started suffering severe bouts of depression. He went from living in the comfort of his own home to living in a homeless shelter. Determined to change his life, he reached out to the VA and received treatment for his bipolar disorder. The VA and its telehealth services, which he accesses from his phone and laptop to receive care and manage his medication, have made all the difference in the world for Tony. He took advantage of the VA's comprehensive work therapy program that led him to a job with the Palmetto Goodwill's Ability One program. He went from a food service worker to cook to supervisor. Tony is now an assistant project manager in downtown Charleston. He is also the first homeowner in his family. Hmm. Telehealth became a godsend for millions of Americans like Tony, especially our seniors during COVID-19. Patients connected with their doctors even when they were isolated. From March of 2020 through February of 2021, more than 28 million Medicare beneficiaries used telehealth services. Donna Avent named the 2021 Pharmacist of the Year has been providing <clears throat> telehealth education free of charge to the residents of Bamberg County, South Carolina since 2020. In this rural community where the nearest doctor is 12 miles away, the nearest ER room, emergency room is a half an hour away and more than 100 seniors received free tablets for health screenings and chronic disease education such as diabetes and hypertension. Seniors use Zoom and the phone. It improved access to healthcare, to doctors and specialists that they otherwise might not be able to see. South Carolina is a leader in the telehealth innovation. The Medical University of South Carolina has one of just two federally recognized telehealth centers of excellence in the nation. In 2021, I introduced the Telehealth Modernization Act with Senator Schatz and a bipartisan group, including Senators Collins and Warnock, which makes telehealth flexibilities permanent even after this pandemic is completely done. Without congressional action, however, these emergency provisions will end 
and they will end soon, like in mid-October of this year. For the tens of millions of Medicare beneficiaries and others who rely on telehealth services, that would be tragic. Federal regulations have not kept up with the technological advancements that we've seen in this country. We must keep telehealth available and accessible for all Americans, including our seniors, our military heroes, and disabled individuals, so that they can take care of themselves and meet the needs that they have. I look forward to learning from today's witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Ranking Member Scott, thank you for your statement. I'll now move to witness introductions. Our first witness is Ms. Eve Hill, a disability rights lawyer at Brown, Goldstein, and Levy. Ms. Hill previously served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General at the U.S. Justice Department in the Civil Rights Division, where she was responsible for oversight of the Div division's disability rights, education, and Title VI enforcement, and the American Indian Working Group. She founded Inclusivity Strategic Consulting, a unit of the law firm designed to help businesses, organizations, government agencies, and industry groups to achieve real inclusion of people with disabilities in their workforces and their communities. Our second witness is Mr. Anil Lewis, Executive Director for Blindness Initiatives at the National Federation of the Blind. Mr. Lewis oversees the development and implementation of projects that improve the education, employment, and quality of life of all blind people. Our third witness is Ms. Julianne uh, Lieberman, uh, the Assistive Technology Specialist at Tech Owls Institute on Disabilities at Temple University in Philadelphia. Ms. Lieberman conducts assistive technology demonstration training for Tech Owl and is responsible for public awareness activities at that organization. She is also blind herself, and she will tell us how she has been personally affected by accessibility problems with federal websites. Ms. Lieberman is, is accompanied by her husband, John Lieberman. She's also accompanied by her guide dog, Bob. That's a good name. <laughs> and for our fourth and final witness, I'll turn to Ranking Member Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ronald G. Holmquist retired to South Carolina after a successful career in the Navy and later as a computer programmer and small business owner. Raised in New Jersey, he joined the U.S. Navy after graduating from high school. He served overseas in Japan and was honorably discharged in 1966, having been promoted to Petty Officer Second Class. He then pursued a career as a computer programmer and an IT specialist in the New York City area. More importantly, he married Bonnie, and they started a family. Ronald and Bonnie just celebrated their 56th wedding anniversary. Wow. What a blessing. Seeking a different pace, they moved to Vermont, where Ronald continued his work as an IT specialist and a small business owner. In 2015, he moved to Charleston, good decision, area to be closer to his family and granddaughter, who is now 10 years old. He is proud to have moved to South Carolina. Currently, Mr. Holmquist receives care for chronic medical conditions at the Ralph H. Johnson VA Health System. He relies on telehealth and remote home monitoring devices to stay connected to his care team. Mr. Holmquist, we look forward to your hearing, this, uh, hearing testimony today and once again, happy 56th wedding anniversary. Nice. I join in those sentiments. Thank you, Ranking Member Scott. And before we move to witness statements, I just want to make, um, make it clear for our audience that um, various senators will be in and out of the hearing today. Uh, Thursday mornings are busy here, lots of hearings and, and commitments that people have. So uh, we'll be acknowledging uh, senators as they arrive and as they, they've been present. I know we're joined already by Senator Rick Scott. And so we'll now move to our first witness statement. Uh, that, is, that is Ms. Hill, and uh, Ms. Hill, you may begin. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Ranking Member and members of the committee. Uh, as 
has already been said, my name is Eve Hill. I'm a partner at Brown, Goldstein, and Levy, and I've dedicated most of my career to impl implementing the rights of people with disabilities. Imagine trying to do your job without access to the internet when everyone else, your boss, your coworkers, your competitors has access. <clears throat> Picture yourself having to call a customer service line every time you need information from an office while your competitors and colleagues get the information they need with a click. Or waiting for a coworker to find time to read a database to you or to interpret a video for you while your colleagues click, scroll, and go. Imagine traveling an hour or more to get to a medical office and waiting for in-person assistant while everyone else sees a doctor through telehealth from their home. Or imagine a telehealth appointment in which your child has to interpret your intimate details for your doctor. Mm. We all laughed at the scene in the movie Coda when the daughter had to interpret the sex lives of her parents for their doctor. But it isn't funny, and it's not fiction. In 2022, 97% of the top million home pages in the world uh, had accessibility barriers, an average of 51 barriers per page. And there's no reason for this. Digital accessibility is not technologically complex. It's been solved since Mark Zuckerberg was in high school. And Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act has required federal agencies to make their technology accessible for 24 years. But 30% of the most popular federal government web pages are inaccessible. And these are ones we use all the time, like weather.gov, energystar.gov, and census.gov. <clears throat> and websites are the simplest form of technology to make accessible. The accessibility of other forms of federal technology is dismal. Clients of my firm right now are dealing with trainings required by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that don't work with blind people screen readers and with intake kiosks at the Social Security Administration that are not accessible to blind people. And federal employees with disabilities are dealing with inaccessible software programs that make it nearly impossible to do their jobs, as well as timekeeping software, office machines, and online trainings that make their jobs more difficult. One might think this inaccessible technology is a relic of the past, but it isn't. One blind employee of a large federal agency for years worked on an inaccessible program that's central to her job, and recently the agency replaced the program with a new one that is also inaccessible. And that agency failed to act on the employee's sec formal Section 508 complaint for eight years so far. In another recent case, an agency sat on a Section 508 complaint for nearly five years and had to be sued under the Amer Administrative Procedure Act in order to act. The Social Security Administration, as a policy matter, is refusing to adopt accessible technology, insisting on wet ink signatures for documents to apply for SSDI benefits in spite of the wide availability security and accessibility of electronic signatures. So what to do? Section 508, in my opinion, needs six improvements. First, transparency. As you mentioned, the Justice Department is required to report on compliance every couple of years, but hasn't done so since 2012. At the same time, GSA is collecting information on compliance, but does not share that information with the Justice Department, with Congress, or with the public. Second, up-to-date standards. Technology develops quickly, and accessibility guidelines keep pace, but federal regulation does not. The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 were released in 2018 and have not been incorporated into the Section 508 standards. Congress needs to ensure that the Access Board has the resources it needs to keep its standards up to date. Third, testing. Agencies clearly cannot rely on the aspirational, misleading, or incorrect statements of their technology vendors. They must have the ability to test technology accessibility themselves before they roll it out. There will need to be a significant remediation effort of, of barriers that already exist in technology. And fifth, oversight. Self-oversight has not worked. A federal agency should be tasked with enforcing compliance with Section 508. And finally, accountability. The federal agencies that are violating Section 508 are violating civil rights. They're harming taxpayers by buying technology that isn't worth what we paid for it, and by making it harder for public servants with disabilities to do their jobs. 
and vendors of inaccessible technology need to be held accountable to their federal customers. Thank you very much for inviting me today, and I appreciate your interest in this topic. Thank you, Ms. Hill, for your, your testimony. Mr. Lewis, you may begin your statement. <clears throat> Thank you. Is the mic? I'm good? Okay. I want to thank the honorable members of the Special Committee on Aging for this opportunity to present on this extremely important topic. I see uh, technology, ICT, information communications technology, is very important because it creates opportunities for us to access the fundamental civil rights uh, that should be ex extended to every American citizen. As stated, my name is Anil Lewis. I'm the Executive Director of Blindness Initiatives for the National Federation of the Blind, the most transformative organization of blind people in this country. And we believe that access to public services and public information is a fundamental civil right. We uh, recognize that ICT holds the hope for us to access these federal programs in a more dynamic fashion. In my written testimony, I go through the process of explaining how when I went blind in 1989, uh, the old service systems that were in place made it frustrating, um, if not impossible, for me to access these services. I love the term that you use. I'm going to use it. Now that we move to the place of the virtual front door, those old services are even worse because we've put more resources in creating the virtual front door and taking them away from the old services, which were mediocre at best. But the, again, the accessible ICT, and I mean accessible, not just information communications technology itself. If it's not accessible, it doesn't work. It holds hope for us to finally really be able to access the information and the services like every other American citizen through screen readers, which convert speech the digital information on computers into speech for me as a blind person to hear, refreshable braille displays like the one I'm using today, which converts that digital information into tactile forms that I can read with my fingers. We can provide access to information to blind individuals, those with low vision, individuals that are deafblind. And because it's speaking the technology, those individuals who are illiterate and couldn't read, because it's a digital and an accessible format, it can convert uh, to foreign languages. Again, creating opportunities for every American citizen to access the programs and services that we should be allowed to. Um, rather than going through a litany of personal uh, examples in my testimony, you'll see references of how inaccessibility has adversely impacted a representative sample of over thousands of people with disabilities, and it's preventing, preventing them from accessing services from the international, I'm sorry, the IRS, the Social Security Administration, Center for Medicare and Medicaid, Department of Education, Small Business Administration, the Veterans Administration, and also even Homeland Security. <clears throat> and the reason that it's impacting is not just because we can't access the information and services, but also we can't become viable federal employees if the systems that are used to support these, the employment, <clears throat> are not accessible or non visually accessible to blind individuals. I want to spend most of my time in, in this remaining few minutes, not to talk about the problems that are created, but just get people to paradigm shift and recognize that accessibility is not difficult. That's the big thing. Accessible coding is just good coding. So we're not adding an additional burden on uh, the existing systems to make them accessible if we focus on accessibility during the design and development process. The only big problem is there's a flawed accessibility implementation strategy within the federal government. In my written testimony, I do an analogy around typing, uh, where individuals in, within the federal government are using Smith Corona typewriters to create documents, taking that document and giving it to someone who can use a word processor to create a digital accessible document. <clears throat> so of course, that person who runs that Smith Corona typewriter is going to think that it's difficult. And of course, it's going to be more expensive because you have to add another layer. The strategy should be to teach that one who's working on that Smith Corona typewriter how to use the word processor to create that accessible document from the start, and then it's seamless. No additional cost, no additional difficulty. It just works. And I just really want to stress, well, really appreciate the fact that this is a very good collaborative effort, uh, bipartisan effort to really meet this need. We know that it's law. Let's just implement it. And the federal government can be an exemplar. <clears throat> one, the federal government can continue to strive to be a model employer making sure that blind people and other people with disabilities have the opportunity to obtain employment, lateral movement, and upward mobility within the federal government. Two, the federal government can implement a procurement process that demands that vendors to the federal government make sure that they provide accessible technology and other services so that they can encourage those vendors to make sure that they are developing accessible uh, information from the beginning. This will also affect not only the vendors' production of accessible materials, but also the training of individuals in the IT profession. 
Because a person who learns to pro program and develop, as long as they learn about accessibility, it's just part of their everyday. I'd like to just really give one quick example of what's really been refreshing for me lately. We know that they've been offering free COVID tests to every American citizen. The National Federation of the Blind reached out to the administration and recognized that these tests were not accessible to blind individuals. We, long story short, have been working with the National Institute of Health, the Association of Administration of Community Living, and we're working to make sure that the whole process from soup to nuts is accessible. The website is accessible. Excuse me, the instructions for the kits, we're working with those manufacturers to make sure that they're accessible. The kits themselves we're working on to be accessible. And the beautiful part about this is twofold. One, people are recognizing accessibility is not expensive and it's not difficult. And two, we're enculturating the thought of accessibility into this whole infrastructure so that every other product or service that NIH works with, especially when we're talking about telemedicine and all these other home healthcare uh, pieces of devices that they're working with are accessible, born accessible from the start. So the same insulin pump that a sighted person uses, a blind person can use because it's accessible. The same home chemotherapy that a person without a disability uses is the same one that a blind person can use who has to have chemo. It's just a win-win. I'm just optimistic that not only will this help us access the fundamental rights that we deserve, but the multimodal resulting impact of all this technology also helps every American citizen, not only just in literacy and language translation, but someone who can see also gets comfort in the validation of an audible confirmation when something happens. Again, thank you for this time to present I'm uh, looking forward to working collaboratively with you moving forward to make the federal government the exemplar in the introduction of accessibility that creates better quality of life for every American citizen. Thank you. Well, Mr. Lewis, thank you for your statement. And, um, as I mentioned, we'll be um, acknowledging Senators, uh, Senator Lieberman, <laughs> we had a Senator Lieberman. Senator Blumenthal has joined us, and now I'll introduce our third witness, Ms. Lieberman. Thank you. <laughs> I, again, I thank you for this opportunity for um, ability to speak with you today. Uh, I come to you not only as a person uh, as evident with the gray hair uh, of the aging community, but also as a person who is blind. I have been uh, diagnosed in uh, 1970 with a progressive vision loss. So I've gone through all the various stages of uh, vis low vision to the point where now I would be considered uh, pro uh, profound vision loss or blind. And that, again, this does impact your daily life, especially when you don't have equal access to information. Um, I work with TechAL, which is, stands for Technology Our Whole Lives. Uh, it is a the Assistive Technology Act program that is located within the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University. So I work, our office works very hard to uh, promote the independence of persons with disabilities um, it, and also promote self-esteem uh, uh, self, self and other uh, personal choice uh, opportunities. And with that said, um, I, again, my experience uh, teaching, I've been teaching for 24 years, persons with vision loss, how to operate a computer uh, independently. And that would be the use of assistive technology as described previously like screen readers. Uh, I, I have to comment when Ms. Hill made the comment about uh, the, the uh, scene in CODA, uh, flashed on a memory of my son accompany me to my mammogram appointment. Wow. And he had, we were given a form to fill out and he had to ask questions. Um, my son, I'm very proud of him and, and he's probably one of the kindest persons in the world said at the end, Mom, I know more about you than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> so again, equal access and equal opportunities to provide information is critical for anybody with any disability of any age. So even though that I am within the uh, older population now, I guess you could say that, I am planning to continue working for some time and having access to this information not only for myself, but also for the customers that I serve. I provide information assistance at my office. And so very often I have to direct people to uh, finding locations on the internet over the phone. And it, I, it really bothers me when I know, in fact, I can't get that information. 
uh, completely. Sometimes there's roadblocks. As an example, um, you know, this past few years, we've all been in a crisis situation uh, dealing with uh, health inequities and also the health situation as a result of COVID. Uh, the, I'm a person that thinks information is power and I rely on reliable information. I would hope that the federal government and its resources like at the CDC would be able to provide me with uh, accurate information. Um, you don't want us to really be running as best their best efforts are with news media uh, and or social media to provide us with information that may or may not be accurate. So we look for these resources that we would hope that would ensure accurate information. Uh, I tried to find the prevalence of uh, COVID activity, and this was in the spring of 20, uh, in my, you know, again, in my region, my state, uh, and my county, uh, and it was presented in a graph with no description. So it was very frustrating. I could get to one point till I could actually identify where I lived and everything was represented in a graph which provided me no information at all. And so, you know, for me, that was, I have to rely on other sources. Now, I'm very, very fortunate that I have a very supportive family, um, incredibly supportive family. Uh, so at, at a routine, my son would come up, uh, he was, but we were both teleworking, uh, obviously, we offices were shut down. And as a routine, he'd come up at least once or twice a week at lunchtime, sit down with his computer and say, okay, mom, here's the updates. <laughs> and so he would read them aloud to me. And it provided assurance to both of us and it helped us make decisions on our activities. Is it safe for me to go to the grocery store? Mm -hmm. Is it safe for me to go um, to church? Mm -hmm. The things that are important to us, we need to know that information so that I know that, okay, I'm safe if I wear my mask or what other guidelines are there, but I, having that initial information of how often this is happening in my neighborhood is in, incredibly important. Uh, you know, going down then to the spring of uh, 21, um, it was wonderful that we had uh, the availability of vaccines. Unfortunately, when I tried to research how I could get a vaccine and make a vaccine appointment, the uh, sites that were directed by the CDC, uh, including some uh, providers, um, they, in order for you to access the information availability of vaccines, you had to click on a map. Mm -hmm. Okay, pointing and clicking is not an option for me. Uh, if it's a gra graphical representation and that the only access you have is clicking with a mouse, it's no access. So what that meant, and then if I did have uh, get to any information, I wouldn't be able to make an appointment. So out of frustration, um, I posted on our um, office, uh, the Institute on Disabilities, listserv, what am I going to do about this? I need to get, find a vaccine. And fortunately, a very respected manager, Jamie, thank you, uh, sent me a, a phone number at the Area Office on Aging uh, and Disability. And she said, I believe they're starting to have appointments in your area. It took me five minutes to schedule an appointment. Mm. I didn't have that information otherwise. There was no information of calling you know, that agency anywhere so that I could have <coughs> made that appointment um, myself. So what, with that said, it was a very positive experience that I had good relationships with my coworkers um, and a very supportive family, but that's not the case for everyone. Uh, I do work with individuals that may be vulnerable uh, for example, that they, if they are blind and they're relying on someone that perhaps is less trustworthy or abusive, uh, you don't want them uh, to be providing that information to someone when they're seeking support services from the government. I really don't think that is something that should be expected. And but again, it puts, does put people in a very risky situation. Uh, and again, that <coughs> I'm fortunate that I do have a great support network, but that's not the case. Of many of my colleagues, uh, I'm active in the Pennsylvania Council of the Blind. Many of my colleagues don't have that option. They live alone, uh, and they don't have that resources. So again, I'm fortunate that I do, to a point where it stops, and that's where I'm hoping that these actions that you're taking today, uh, in this conversation, you can carry it forth. And like my colleagues here on the left that said to me, or my right said to me, that it, it follows through. If you start with one, make some corrections at the VA, and then other websites, they see how it works, 
then they can become accessible. Likewise, in the commercial market, it's going to happen. It, again, is something that's not hard to do. There are guidelines. Most people, when they create a website that's not accessible, it's not because they're intentionally trying to lock me out of information. Uh, they just don't understand that is a need. Um, and so therefore, they don't know. So in my written testimony, I have some references <coughs> of where you could find about the website accessibility guidelines that are available so they can review. And um, also that there's you know, information about um, how to get support services uh, in order to do that. I do caution our federal website. Ms. Lieberman, I just want to make sure we can move on to okay. our next witness. If you can wrap up. Very quickly, yes. I just want to caution you not to take advantage of the uh, commercial ones that say the, the uh, we can fix your accessibility. Uh, those overlays that they provide for it is artificial intelligence that unfortunately, uh, it's, as much as it's evolved, it isn't the answer. They can't guess what my needs are. We have to be able to use our, our software independently. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Ms. Lieberman. It will now uh, conclude our witness statements with Mr. Holmquist. You may begin. Good morning, Chairman Casey, Ranking Member Scott, and Distinguished Panel. Thank you for inviting me to speak to the Senate Aging Committee about my experience with telehealth and the VA. You probably can tell my, that I'm not a native of South Carolina. I spent most of my life up north before moving here seven years ago. There are a lot of good reasons to live in South Carolina. I moved here to be close to my son, daughter-in-law, granddaughter, who is now 10. I have the pleasure of helping to take care of her a few days a week. When I moved to South Carolina in 2015, South Carolina veterans welcomed me. I was invited to Port of Charleston for the commissioning ceremony for the USS Ralph Johnson, a guided missile cruiser named after a Marine from South Carolina who posthumously received the Medal of Honor for his heroic actions during the Vietnam War. Ralph Johnson used his body to shield two fellow Marines from a grenade absorbing the blast and dying instantly. I am wearing his baseball cap today in his honor. Mm. South Carolina veterans recommended that I check into the VA. I've been with the Charleston VA since 2016. What I did not expect before I moved here was the excellent health care I would get at the Ralph H. Johnson VA Health Center, which is also named after that same heroic Marine. A couple of years ago, I was invited to sign up for telehealth, and I was skeptical. I have lots of severe medical problems. But I never signed up for VA health before 2016 because I thought it was for veterans who were hurt and maimed in Vietnam and other wars. Mm. I figured they needed it more than I did. Mm. I served in the U.S. Navy during the Vietnam War, but most of my active service was in Japan where I served as a communications technician. A highlight was attending a performance by Bob Hope. After being honorably discharged from the Navy, I eventually ended up in Montpelier, Vermont, where I worked in information technology. I also served as a volunteer EMT for about a decade in fire and rescue. In those days, all we had was a bottled oxygen to keep people going and to keep people going until the ambulance arrived. We did not have all the modern technology they have these days. Sometimes the ambulance got lost in the back roads of rural Vermont. I guess it was thought to be tough to be navigated when the cows moved. With telehealth, the VA can manage my complex chronic conditions very well. The VA assigned me a telehealth case manager. What a pleasure. Mine is an RN with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing who nourishes stuff. Her name is Frances Santana. I thought that all were vets, but not all of them are. And they always say, thank you for your service. The Ralph Johnson Health Center is a teaching hospital, so some of the docs are from the Medical University of South Carolina. So you get the best, smartest medical staff to be found. A function of telehealth is that they watch after you. I send my vitals to my RN daily, and if there's a problem, you get a call immediately. She has direct contact with docs, fellow RNs, and other providers, and will get answers to your problems or education for you on medicine and procedures. She gets problems resolved for you. 
The big plus at the VA is that one computer system is looked at by all, including docs, RN, and medical staff. When you have an appointment, your provider has all the necessary information. I have many decades in experience of computer programming for the early days of the in industry. It is so important to have computers fully and properly used to benefit patients. Another point is that telehealth and technology have made care more personal, not less. I have five different cardiologists who treat me. When I have questions about a medication or why I haven't taken off a medication, I would pick up the phone and call Frances. She checks with the doctor and tells them to prescribe it because other medications have adverse reactions to my existing medications. I also use my health vet to make appointments. It is very effective. Telehealth is a critical important to is critically important to Vietnam's care, veterans' care. All veterans should have this opportunity. Telehealth and the VA need to stay for the benefit of all vets. It would be a shame to lose these valuable assets. Thank you for letting me share my story. Mr. Holmquist, thanks so much for your testimony and thank you for your service. We're grateful. And we're grateful you're with us today. Um, I will now turn for our first um, set of questions to Senator Blumenthal. And we're joined by Senator Braun. Thank you very, very much, Senator Casey. And thanks to you and Ranking Member Scott <coughs> for having this hearing, which is so important. Thanks to all of the experts who have come to talk to us. And a special thanks to you, Mr. Holmquist, for your service. Uh, I gather you're not from <clears throat> South Carolina, but you lived for a long time in Vermont. And as a fellow New Englander, I'm especially grateful for your personal insight into how telehealth and the VA, this technology, is making your life better. And uh, I would agree with you that South Carolina is a good place to live, and it's also a nice place to visit. Uh, thanks to Senator Scott for inviting you to be part of this proceeding and sharing your story, which is really powerful because I think you have shown us how telehealth, and I'm quoting you, uh, telehealth and technology have made care more personal, not less. I think that's a really important point. And telehealth, I, I'm on the Veterans Affairs Committee and uh, the Armed Services Committee. Telehealth really has broadened <coughs> and deepened the kind of care that people have available, especially for people who have disabilities, may not be able to travel mm -hmm. to the VA hospital in West Haven or in Newington, but can get care at home if they have access to the technology. Uh, in Connecticut, 21% of all adults live with a disability, and 27% of all veterans, 27% of all veterans in our state have a disability. So this kind of technology is very, very important to them. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit, Mr. Holmquist, talking about maybe some of your buddies in South Carolina, <clears throat> how access to this technology is very important to them, and maybe some of the difficulties they've encountered in accessing telehealth. I think the access to telehealth um, for myself, uh, if I had a question, I wouldn't know who to call as far as the doctor was going to be concerned. But I could call Francis and get her to be contacting the appropriate doctors, the appropriate services that you might need, get those services to give me a call, to set up an appointment, to follow up on what is needed for my, my care. That was the biggest assistance for me, was to have that synergy where she could talk to other people. Uh, I wouldn't know who to call, to be honest with you, but she could. And she handles that for me very well. It's just fantastic. If I have a, a problem of any kind, she's, my phone calls her first, and she can solve the problem for me. And you mentioned you have access to five different cardiologists, some of the best in the state, maybe the nation. Yes, absolutely. Uh, 
I came down with some heart problems. Uh, and because they, this is a teaching hospital, there are VA doctors, um, MUSC doctors that all get together when you have your, uh, they have their meeting in the morning when they talk to you when you're in the hospital. There's a whole bunch of them that come in there and discuss what's going on. And when they leave there, they have a plan of attack on what's going on. In fact, the one day they said, oh, by the way, we have discussed this, and we think you need a defibrillator implanted in you. And I said, wait a minute, am I that bad? And their decision was, it better have a defibrillator available than have to wait for one. So I was very pleased with that. Uh, and I went along with what they said. I trust every single doctor and nurse at the VA. They are just fantastic. The people that are with the VA uh, are dedicated. Um, the people that help them out, the their nurses and so on, everybody is so dedicated and qualified to do their job here. It's unbelievable. Well, we're trying to push the VA to do even more of that kind of telehealth, and the present secretary of the VA, Dennis McDonough, is very much on board with that approach. So I'm going to pass along your insights and your story to him, and thank you very much for joining us today. Two of my sons have served, one as a Navy SEAL, the other as a Marine Corps combat infantry officer in Afghanistan. They have made use of VA services from time to time, and uh, I hope it's available to even more people in South Carolina and throughout the country. And uh, thanks to uh, Chairman Casey and to our ranking member, Senator Scott, for this hearing today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank them for their service. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. I'll turn next to Ranking Member Scott, who will share his time with Senator Braun, I'm told. Thank you, Chairman Casey, and thank you, Senator Blumenthal, for your kind comments about the importance of living in South Carolina or visiting South Carolina if you have to represent other states. And thank you also for your time and your service and your dedication uh, on the Veterans Committee as well as the Senate Armed Services Committee. Certainly working in bipartisan coalition or in fashion is really important for our country to see and having our witnesses uh, watch that hopefully will improve just a little bit people's perception of how Congress or the Senate actually works together. Uh, Mr. Thank Holmquist, you. thank you for your comments. Certainly proud to have you in South Carolina. Thank you for your comments about uh, Mr. Johnson as well, Ralph H. Johnson, who gave his life uh, for the the salvation, uh, saving the lives of, of two other Marines. Uh, it was such a powerful story. I was at his commissioning of the USS Ralph Johnson in 2018, uh, a powerful story that we should all read about. And I thank you, uh, Senator Blumenthal, for focusing many of your questions on the importance of telehealth and how telehealth is actually bridging a gap and bringing expert care to where the person who needs it the most. Uh, with your uh, questions, I'm going to go ahead and defer to Senator Braun, since you and I both were going to focus on the, the telehealth environment. Uh, Senator Braun, I'll give you the, the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, as well. My question is going to be for Ms. Lieberman. Uh, before I got here in the Senate, I ran a logistics and distribution company for 37 years. And I remember vividly early on how crude our systems were when we were starting to automate. I think it might have been a radio shack system or something when we first started. Um, I do know that to be competitive in any business now, and especially in one like ours, when it's sprawling, it was so little for so long, technology and being on the leading edge was the differentiator in many cases whether you were going to be successful in business or not. Uh, two of my uh, four kids, my son, started about 15 years ago, right when we were getting some size and we had to say either we're going to embrace technology or we're going to be left in the dust. Uh, thank goodness my older son, uh, he got schooled in it, is great at it, and we decided to do it. And he and my younger son now run the company with one of my two daughters. I was listening to the testimony, and it is so reminiscent of what in the early days where we weren't 
quite doing things the way they should be, mostly due to budgetary issues. And since I've been here in the Senate, our technology is pretty good here uh, for senators, and I'm sure over on the other uh, side for representatives, but I get complaints often when we're interfacing with the IRS, with the VA. And then hearing your testimony, uh, especially in trying to access uh, being impaired in, in the way that you have to deal with it, you know, it's really kind of almost shameful because when you've got all these agencies spending this much money and you're having simple issues of connectivity, you look at the stats here, which the Information Technology Innovation Foundation, 30% of the most popular federal websites did not pass an automated accessibility test for their homepage. I mean, that's almost laughable if it wouldn't be so... Uh, sad. So please elaborate uh, on, um, in your particular case, what you've experienced, and then maybe give me a few ideas, give us a few ideas on what minimally needs to be done to see a difference. Sure. Um, I think first off, uh, understanding how someone that is blind is accessing a, a website is the way things are logically arranged. Uh, screen readers technically will read from uh, right, you know, excuse me, left to right, up and down, and they'll read everything. So when things are designed uh, that, especially those that are low vision, that are it's cluttered and things are, are, are low contrast, for example, uh, that can be very difficult to, for them to navigate and also for the screen reader to interpret the information. So what we, most screen readers will do, um, that is the software that I use uh, to access, uh, it will then allow us to be able to navigate quickly to various sections of information. So if, if a website is designed with good structure, uh, with headings and with uh, well-labeled links, uh, when I say well-labeled links, when you talk about those automated um, accessibility checkers, um, I, I'm kind of grinning it underneath because sometimes they'll say all the, everything's fine, your, your links are labeled. But it's not helpful when they're labeled click here or see more. Because uh, if it's taken out of context um, in that list that the screen reader will do, it's very, um, again, disconcerting because I don't know what it's referring to. So having things that are well-structured, well-labeled, well-described, uh, so graphics that are important, um, I do, will have to commend the uh, NASA most recent ones with the uh, images from, the, uh, from space is a delightful visit for somebody who's blind because it does give us a great appreciation of what these images are uh, and very well-crafted um, description. So I, there are some organizations that are getting it, that understand it. Um, building a good, uh, again, I mentioned the AI, artificial intelligence that's being applied. Uh, that's, no, that's not a good way of going about it. If you want to think about having accessibility, you start with the, with the basics of accessible design. So there are, as I mentioned, there are guidelines that you can refer to. Uh, and the best thing that I have found at my office they like to do is they pass it by, if Jolan can read it, then it's okay. <laughs> so a lot of times I'll, I will be asked by other organizations. In fact, I recently um, provide technical assistance, assistance for our, the South D, Southeast Pennsylvania Transportation Authority, or SEPTA, uh, on their accessibility of their website. And um, I provided them examples uh, with my screen reader allowed so they can hear it and what the experience was. So yeah, the, there, there's information out there on how you can create it. Good structure uh, from the beginning, good design, uh, saves a lot of time in re remediation. You don't want to wait till a complaint. Yeah, <laughs> that all makes sense. And I think for as much uh, money as we spend and for all the good things we try to do through our various agencies and is important as uh, high-speed anything is, when you've got that and you're not formulating uh, the right home pages, the right techniques, uh, I would welcome any of you to make sure to give us uh, air on the side of getting a hold of us. My Senate office, uh, if you're having trouble doing it through the agencies, call my Senate office. Tell my staff 
and we will get in touch with those various agencies to see why they're not maybe putting the resources, putting the effort to it, when that is so highly recommended, it's so great when it does work, to where you don't have to deal with the frustration of the basics. So keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Braun. I'll, I'll also uh, turn back to Ms. Lieberman um, for a question, and I'll, I'll include it um, in this question. I'll direct it also at Mr. Lewis. Both of you have had personal experience living with a disability, as your testimony indicates so clearly. You've also both had decades of experience working with people with disabilities. You've seen both ends of it, hearing from those who have had their own experiences and having your own. The, the hearing we're having today is, as I said earlier, particularly relevant because we celebrate this week 32 years anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the goal of the law is then President Bush said um, to, to quote, let the shameful wall of exclusion con come tumbling down, unquote. Uh, that wall of exclusion is still unfortunately um, so evident in, um, in some of these issues we're talking about today. 32 years later, people with disabilities still face these walls of exclusion uh, because of how technology has advanced and how we haven't kept up with uh, making the, that technology accessible. And um, of course, we're focused today on federal agencies. Um, so I, I'd ask both uh, Ms. Lieberman and Mr. Lewis can each of you share an, an example of people that you've worked with who have experienced information technology barriers and the impact that it's had on them? You want to go first? Or? Oh, no, I'm a Southern gentleman. Oh, a Southern gentleman. Well, thank you, Southern gentleman. <laughs> um, see, I'm, I'm from Pennsylvania, so we all act, <laughs> we talk a little fast and we'll go a little. Uh, actually, uh, Senator Case, I did forget to mention that I was. Uh, I, my formative years were spent in St. Clair, uh, which is a, a small town in Schuylkill County. Schuylkill County, right. So, yeah, I'm a cold cracker, too, <laughs> by, by background. But I've lived 40 years outside of Philadelphia uh, in Chester County. Uh, to answer your question, as far as the people that I've worked with, uh, access is critical, um, as I've mentioned several times. And some of the barriers that they have, um, if websites are designed, oh, that you just need to tab, um, if you open up most websites, especially federal websites, I believe when I, I attempted to look at the IRS one, um, I think the opening page had over 200 links. Um, so if you use your tab key, it's going to tab through each one of those links. Um, so there has to be a way that you can structure it so that you can get to things very quickly to get your answer. Because quite frankly, time is not only money, but time is also patience. So how much patience does, does that have? I've had uh, several individuals that will tell me, oh, I just gave up because it was just too, it was too tedious. It was too hard to get to the information that I needed. And that seems to be one of the, uh, I would say, the carryover in most cases with all disabilities uh, and, and the older population. Uh, our aging population, they want to an answer now. Uh, they don't have to want to go through 15 steps in order to get to that answer. Um, they want to have that information as easily found as, as possible. So that's pretty much the experience I've had with others as well uh, on websites, not just federal websites, but in general. Yeah. And I would have to offer that with respect to websites, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a host of different examples of individuals that have tried to access <clears throat> information from the federal government website. And it's not even just a factor that you go to that site and it's inaccessible. It's to the point where there is a little bit of accessibility built in, so you can go through the process of actually providing essential information to get to the place where you need to get the information that you're requesting. And after you, you know, go through the tedious process of trying to maneuver through, and you finally get to that place where you're able to click this link that gives you access to this document that you've been searching for for about an hour, you click it, and the resulting document is inaccessible. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, it's like the virtual front door is open, and you walk in, and there are other doors that are still closed. Mm -hmm. um, the, the one I really like to highlight, because we're talking about, again, information communication technology. And let me say, for the record, I'm a believer in the potential. 
my undergraduate is in computer information systems, and I've been for years talking to individuals that this is not very difficult because in the world of digital information, it all boils down eventually to ones and zeros. Mm -hmm. And if we focus on doing it, during that development and design process, we can make it accessible. It's not a problem. We just have to make sure that it's intentional and not done after we've done this wonderful creation of something. And then we say, oh, now we should make it accessible. No, that's why it's difficult. That's why it's expensive. Social Security Administration trying to reach efficiencies in dealing with the old school service system where people have to go into the office to get access to services, implemented a kiosk system, which I have credibility. It's much better than going and just pulling a number. Uh, you can provide information that allows them to streamline <clears throat> the type of service that you specifically need. You just simply go to the kiosk, you enter your information, including your social security number, your reason for the visit, boom, and you get associated not only just with a number, but with the number that goes to that person that's gonna help you with that specific issue. The only problem is, as a blind person, when I go to that kiosk, it's inaccessible. So either now I have to coordinate my visit to the Social Security office with a friend or family member that I trust, yep. or because it's not staffed by the Social Security Administration staff, I have to ask a total stranger to enter my Social Security number yeah. into this kiosk in order for me to get the same services. So yeah, there, there's a host of examples we can give, but again, I still like to continue to focus on the fact that the knowledge for accessibility is there. The tools already exist. Mm -hmm. It's really just about the efficient and e ethical implementation of these strategies. <clears throat> and then that way, all the money we're spending on DOJ complaints and the, the four-year wait to get access to services, all of that time, energy, and resources can be refunneled into training the people who are developing the information delivery systems, and then it's a win-win for everybody. Yep. Thanks very much, and I'm, I'll turn next to Ms. Hill. As you know, the Department of Justice is required to issue a report on the executive branch's compliance with accessibility requirements in Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, which you uh, were highlighting and you know so much about. This report hasn't been completed in the past 10 years. As I mentioned, Ranking Member Scott, Senator Burr, and I recently joined uh, together to uh, call on the Justice Department to begin issuing reports uh, these reports again. We are joined by uh, Senator Durbin, Senator Grassley, Senator Murray, uh, Chair of the Health Education Labor Pensions Committee, and Senator Duckworth. In your view, why are these reports uh, important, number one, and how will Pennsylvanians who rely on government services like Medicare, Social Security, and the VA health system benefit, benefit from these reports being uh, made available again? Thank you, yes. Uh, transparency is really important in this field because without it, agencies are tempted to not comply and wait to see if they get caught by someone who encounters the barrier. This transparency encourages agencies to take accessibility seriously at the beginning of a technology purchase when it's easy and inexpensive to do rather than wait and, and have to do fixes that are expensive and time consuming. And Pennsylvania's and others will benefit not only from that cost savings, but from the improved level of customer service that all that technology will provide if it's accessible from the beginning. Not only for people with disabilities who will be able to count on being able to use it, but as uh, Mr. Lewis has said, accessibility is good design. So everyone with, a dis everyone with and without a disability will benefit from that additional good design. And then the federal government's uh, purchase power will improve those vendors' ability to have accessible products as a matter of course, and that ripples out into the rest of the world. Well, that all makes sense, and it's all the more reason why we've got to keep pushing um, every agency, but in this case, to, to push the Department of Justice to begin to issue those reports again after such a long period of time of not issuing those reports. I'll turn back to, to uh, Ms. Lieberman. In your role as coordinator of the assistive technology program in Pennsylvania, you, you come in contact with many people with many different types of disabilities. We know that there are over 61 million Americans in our country with a disability. Almost 2 million of those are, are in, in a state like Pennsylvania or in, a state, uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. As I mentioned earlier, the pandemic has accelerated the federal government's adoption of electronic information and technology communications to share information 
and provide services online. That's a good thing, that those services are available online. The critical benefits from the federal government, such as Medicare enrollment, now primarily take place online. Can you tell the committee why it's essential to ensure online services, especially federal online services, are accessible? I think it's, well, besides the fact that it is my right as a citizen of the United States to expect that I can obtain services from that when it's needed, uh, something like Medicare, uh, for example, um, it, it's vital that I would have that access to that information and be able to complete it independently. Uh, things that would be of note uh, would be when we are requested to complete a form online uh, that all the form fields are labeled. Uh, they may show up on the screen, but the screen reader doesn't have that information, so it's not telling me, so I just get blank edit fields. So for me, uh, for, to be quickly and uh, efficiently apply without having to ask somebody else to help me, that's the type of uh, barriers that I see as well with individuals that contact our office, that they seem to have issues is it, is it because the technology is too complex, so they think, or is it the website's not accessible? Sometimes I have to do a little detective work to try it out myself to see if indeed, if it is, uh, an, an, again, operator error or is an error literally in the design of the website. So that, that I've encountered that a few times um, over the years. I've been there nine years, and I would say maybe uh, I can think of 25 cases where people have asked me to get that uh, assistance for them in order to, um, to access information on the internet, whether it be Medicare or any other uh, location um, on, in the internet. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> Hopefully, no, you did. You did. And thank you for for that um, that testimony. I appreciate it. We'll now turn uh, next to Senator Rosen for her questions. Thank you so much, Chair Casey. I really appreciate you bringing forward this hearing, and thank you to everyone for being here uh, uh, digitally, and uh, um, and we just appreciate what you've been doing and how we can help you. And I want to talk a little bit about digital equity, um, because the bipartisan infrastructure law that Congress passed last year, it is the most significant federal investment we've had ever made to close the digital divide, something that's really important. Uh, I was proud to be one of the group of senators that helped draft the key pr uh, portions of the law, which included critically important digital equity provisions. Uh, the past three years have shown us how critical uh, access to affordable, high-speed broadband is for everyone. For everyone, the pandemic has shown us that. But speed and low cost are just part of ensuring digital equity for all individuals. Digital literacy, access to devices that meet users' needs, applications that enable and encourage self-sufficiency and participation, well, they're all components of ensuring digital equity and inclusion. And so in drafting the equity provisions of the infrastructure law, Congress did make it a priority to improve the digital equity as well, including for individuals with disabilities. So I'd like to ask Mr. Lewis and then Ms. Lieberman, how are your organizations working with NTIA and the state broadband offices to ensure that these digital equity programs that we created here in Congress are promoting equity among our aging, disabled, and our veterans communities? And if you aren't collaborating, um, this is something that we should consider doing. Do you need help? Or can you just speak to that? So um, um, let's start with uh, Ms. Lieberman. Uh, I'm very fortunate. Um, where I work. Um, Tech Al has participated very much so in health equity issues uh, in two areas. Uh, in initially, we received uh, some money from uh, the Area Office on Aging Funding, and with that, we expanded our lending library so that we could introduce iPads to seniors so that they could have that same access to telehealth uh, to Zoom, as we had previously heard described, so they can have all that kind of access. And we went put it into our lending library um, and we made the decision for them to borrow it for a rather extensive time period so that they can explore whether that works for them first. Um, because one of the things that we've noticed over the years, assistive technology uh, can be abandoned if people can't 
uh, if, if they haven't had an opportunity to try it first, then they have a, a tendency to uh, purchase something or have something provided and it sits in the drawer. Last thing we wanted to do was have this resource is not used properly. So that's the intent that we had with um, you know, addressing the need initially. Uh, we now subsequently have uh, received funding uh, so that we can expand the health equity to providing tablets um, for individuals that have no computer access in the home. Uh, and that is, again, is not necessarily disability-based, uh, but it could be anybody that doesn't have that access in the home. And that program is going like gangbusters uh, with applications uh, of, from across the state. I think the latest I heard was that we were up to uh, like 1,200. Uh, but don't quote me on the data to date applications that we've uh, provided for the Android tablets. Um, I have just a minute left. Can we have Mr. Lewis, could you speak a little bit? Are you working, um, are you having cooperation with other offices to be sure that we're doing some of the same things that Ms. Lieberman uh, spoke about? Uh, sure, would you I, like I will to address be, this? I will be brief and just state yeah. that I, I will be reaching out to you after the hearing to see how we can work with those entities because as a nationwide organization of blind individuals, we've been focusing mostly on working regarding broadband access with some of the commercial providers, Comcast, et cetera, with some of the innovative some programming guys. they've been doing to get it in the rural areas, but I would like to explore other ways that we can work with some of the entities that you just mentioned. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, we'll, we'll get together. Um, I know I only have 42 seconds left. The last thing I wanted to just uh, uh, ask, and I'll take the response off the record, um, is driver assistant technology for disabled veterans, because Nevada, we have 225,000 veterans, uh, but we're getting all this assisted um, um, driverless, you know, this new technology that you don't have to drive the car, and, and I think our veterans really deserve that. And so um, we're developing legislation to provide tax credit to all disabled veterans, no matter what level of disability, to cover the cost of driver-assisted technologies, whether they're just helping them to park or uh, um, cruise control, the mirrors, any of the features that we have. It doesn't have to be a driverless vehicle. And so, Mr. Holt, Holmquist, we're going to uh, ask you this question. You could submit that answer to us off the record. Uh, I'm not in the room, so I don't, I'm sure there's somebody after me. And and uh, um, otherwise, if, if Chair Casey says there isn't, we, we can have you answer. Otherwise, I'll take it off the record. The, uh, it's perfectly appropriate to answer it if, if he, Mr. Lewis, if oh, you want to. Oh, thank you. So, how, so, Mr. Holmquist, how do driver assisted technologies and all the uh, related supports help level the playing field for disabled veterans and their quality of life after they return home? Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not clear on the driver assisted uh, cars. Well, not, maybe not where they don't drive you by themselves, but I know that there's new technologies that will help you park, right? They're assisted parking, or there are special mirrors, or you can see the backup cameras. They can help you notice if someone's getting close and merging. So that's, that's what I'd like to ask you about. Can you hear me okay? That's okay. We can take, we can... Take it off yeah. the record if, if it's um, yeah. okay, Mr. Holmes. Yeah, we, we can. We can. Um, if if you want to, you could provide an answer in writing, or if you want to answer now, what's your preference? I, I would take it off record if you can, okay. because we just had someone interrupt us on the loudspeaker here. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I don't know what you were saying. I'm sorry. Oh, no. okay. Well, I, thank you. But I'm beyond us here. Oh, okay. <laughs> control. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chair Casey. Appreciate you. Yes. Thank you, Senator. Senator Rosen, thanks very much. And um, just for, for everyone to know, and Mr. Holmquist, we often have questions that get submitted for the record, and they're answered in writing, and that, that becomes part of the record uh, after the hearing's over. So it's nothing, nothing unusual about that, and we, we appreciate uh, uh, his willingness to do that. I, before, I know we have to, to conclude um, a little bit early today, but before we do that, I just wanted to, to pose maybe one more question to uh, Ms. Hill um, about the, the law. Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, as we've cited before, establishes the floor from which experts at the Access Board set standards for accessible information 
technology for the federal government. Despite the good intentions of this law, Section 508, there are serious accessibility gaps across the federal government. Today's hearing has, if anything, reinforced that fact. Are there changes to Section 508 that would bring it in line with the, uh, the time, so to speak, after a quarter century uh, of this law being on the books? Thank you for that question. I think we have learned a great deal over the last 24 years about how implementation of accessibility in technology works. Okay. And one of the things that we've learned uh, both in the <coughs> private sector and in the federal government if, is that self-monitoring does not work. Um, and so a federal agency should be tasked with enforcing compliance with Section 508. The federal government experienced a similar issue with the Architectural Barriers Act back in the 1960s, and the Access Board was eventually given enforcement authority un under that act, and the same thing could happen here. In addition, right now, the vendors of inaccessible technology who may be not giving their clients the full scope of the inaccessibility of their technologies uh, need to have uh, methods of accountability. So federal agencies need to be able to take action <coughs> against those, uh, those vendors and to rescind contracts and take other actions. And that's not available or not clear right now in Section 508. Well, that's, <clears throat> that's helpful to have that because we obviously want to make um, um, changes to law where we can. Um, Mr. Lewis said it pretty well in his opening. Um, I'm quoting from his his very simple, blunt statement. He said, accessibility isn't that difficult. It's the law, let's just implement it. <clears throat> so sometimes the challenge is implementing the law appropriately, and we've got some shortfalls here. But in addition to implementation of existing law, we want to consider <clears throat> ways that we can, uh, uh, in fact, change the law. Just have one more question that, that uh, my staff has has given me, and I want to make sure that we get this on the record. Um, the Blind Veterans of America first brought federal accessibility shortfalls to my attention way back in 2018. I didn't realize it was that long ago. They remain concerned that the VA is still far behind. And so, Ms. Hill, I'm going to turn to you again because these are questions we should have answered on the record if we can. You've received the report required by the VA Website Accountability Act, the law that I passed to Senator Moran, I um, made reference to earlier. We know the VA is answering questions um, about how they will move the bill, f the the ball forward. Um, but what should we be looking for as markers of success? If you could give us some some free guidance on that. <laughs> Certainly. Um, if, you're, if an entity is planning to achieve success in accessibility, there are a few things they have to do. One is stop digging into inaccessibility. So stop bringing in new technologies that are not accessible. And that involves not taking your vendor's word for it, but testing your own technology before you roll it out. And that involves both automated and user testing. Um, the other things are a substantial remediation effort. And that involves planning, identifying what's wrong, which really requires an audit of what's wrong, and then prioritizing when you're going to fix things in order, what's most important to fix, scheduling deadlines, holding, assigning staff with responsibility and authority to get the job done, and paying attention to whether the deadlines are met, and then consequences for when the deadlines are met. And then the things that I saw from the VA, None of those elements were, pre were present. Well, that's very helpful for us as we uh, discharge one of the obligations of the United members of the Senate and committees in the Senate, and that's uh, oversight is one of, the, one of the, uh, the changes that you have suggested. So I want to thank our witnesses for their testimony and for their willingness to bring their professional and personal experience to the to this hearing so that we can make changes and, and hold uh, federal agencies and, and hold uh, our government accountable and to make sure that, um, that there's accessibility uh, for people with disabilities 
um, in, in all kinds of settings, but especially in settings like the Veterans Administration. Today's hearing shows that there's a long way to go before federal technology is fully accessible for people with disabilities, for older Americans, and for veterans. It also shows that Congress needs to take a close look at Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act to see if changes are needed. In the meantime, there is a path to ensuring websites and other technologies are accessible with existing laws, as I mentioned earlier. I plan to work with the Biden administration to make sure it continues prioritizing improved disability access to federal technology and online services. A good first step would be for the Department of Justice to begin issuing, again, the biennial accessibility reports required by Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. This will provide taxpayers with an, an important status update that is um, at least eight years past due. As we move forward, let's keep the disability community's long-held motto of, quote, nothing about us without us, unquote. We should keep that front of mind and make sure that, that they have a seat at the table when it comes to um, accessing in important information that they need and that their families need. Uh, Ranking Member Scott has submitted a closing statement for the record, and with that, uh, I'll also mention, I want to mention for the record as well, that uh, if senators have additional questions for the witnesses or statements to be added, as I mentioned earlier, the hearing record will be kept open for seven days until next Thursday, August the 4th. But again, I want to thank our witnesses for their testimony and for their work in preparing for this hearing and being with us today. And uh, this concludes uh, today's hearing.